Welcome to Every Nation City Church Next Step Classes. My name is Amy Polis, and I'm going to be sharing with you today the second step, which is how can I know God? Now, you've just come from the gospel class recently, and in the gospel class, you either recently gave your life to Jesus or you've been walking with the Lord for a while. But I want to say congratulations on finishing that first step. But today we're going to talk about the next step, and actually it's a question how can I know God? Or another way to say it is, can God be known personally? So let's start with prayer. God, we thank you so much for t this session. We thank you, God, that as a disciple, we can take steps to grow in our walk with you. And God, I pray for a spirit of wisdom and revelation, and you'd help everyone who is listening to this to help them to grow in their walk with Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So the question is, how can I know God? Well, to answer that question depends on how you define the word know. So we're going to go to John 17, verses 1 through 4. And Jesus is just about to go to the cross, and he is praying to the Father for his disciples. And it says he looked towards heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. This is one of the clearest definitions of eternal life. Jesus is defining eternal life for us here. And he says this, that eternal life is that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. This word know in the Greek is the word gnosko. And it means to come to know, to perceive, to feel, to know intimately. You see, eternal life is not just living eternally, but it's knowing God personally. Jesus Christ right here is defining eternal life as knowing him intimately, personally. And this is what God has for every Christian. You see, God wants us to know him. He wants us to have a relationship with him. He wants us to be his friend. You see, but there's a difference between knowing about somebody and knowing them personally. You see, I know all about Ronald Reagan. I know that he was our 40th president. I know he was married to Nancy Reagan. I know he was one time the governor of California. I know that he was called the great communicator. And I know a lot about Ronald Reagan that he said, Gorbachev, tear down that wall. You see, I know a lot about Ronald Reagan, but do I really know him? Do I know him personally? No, I don't. I've never spent time with his family. I've never had dinner with him. You see, I know a lot of facts about Ronald Reagan, but there's a big difference between knowing about him and knowing personally. Well, it's the same way with God. You see, we can know a lot of facts about God, but do we know him personally? If I were to ask you, what are some things that you know about God? Tell me some things. You would say, well, I know that God created the heavens and the earth. I know that God parted the Red Sea, and I even know that God loves me. But have you experienced that love? Have you personally experienced the love of God? Have you experienced a friendship with God? And that's what this is all about, step two, is how can I know God personally? You see, many people hear the gospel. They receive it with joy. They receive forgiveness of sins. But they are missing the very reason Jesus died, to reconcile us back to God. All the way back in Genesis, God created us to know him and love him and to walk with him as his friend. When Adam and Eve sinned, the Bible says, they were separated from God. And the Bible in Genesis 3, 8 to, through 10 said, then God, the man and the, his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to man and said, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. You see, 
in these verses, it shows that God's original intent was to walk with man and woman and to be their friend. But because of shame, because of sin, it says that Adam and Eve hid from God. Well, not much has changed. We are still hiding from God because of our sin and because of our shame. So God reached out again and sent his only son, Jesus, to bring us back into relationship with him. And it says in Ephesians 3.12, because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. Isn't that amazing? Because of Jesus Christ, we don't have to be timid. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to shrink back in God's presence. We can come confidently and boldly into the presence of God. And Ephesians 1.15 says, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. Can you hear the heart of God in these verses? He wanted to, in advance to bring us into family, to adopt us. He wants us to be his friends, to be his sons and daughters, and to adopt us into his family. Let me put it this way. You can have Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You can receive forgiveness of sins. But if you continue on in your Christian walk without a personal relationship and friendship with God, you're missing the very reason Jesus came and died. Knowing God is your single greatest privilege as a Christian. God wants this relationship with you. And he longs for you to long for it as well. So how can we know God? How can we personally have this relationship with God? I just want to give you a few things, and these are from my own experience, and these are some things in the Word of God that are going to help you in your journey with God. The first thing is make God your number one priority. We've already assumed that you've given your life to Jesus, right? Once you give your life to Jesus, you are given access into the presence of God and to, in the relationship with God. But you yourself can make God your number one priority. Rick, Pastor Rick Warren said this, you are as close to God as you choose to be. You are going to become a friend of God when you want to become a friend of God. You see, you're never going to become a friend of God in your spare time. God wants this relationship with you, but you have to make him your number one priority. You know, I think of King David. And if you were to ask King David, in, in who is known as a man after God's own heart, if you were to ask him, David, what do you seek after most? Riches? No, not really. What about conquering kingdoms? No. What about a palace? Do you want a great palace? Are you seeking that? Um, no, not really. Well, what is it, David, you're seeking after? Well, we have his answer in Psalm 23, 4. One thing I have desired of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. You see, David is giving us a picture of what it means to seek God and to put him first in our life. He, God is our one desire. He is the one thing that we are to go after and to make a priority to seek him and to know him. So the first thing we can do to know God more personally is to make him your number one priority. Well, what does that look like? This is what it looks like. I'm going to share a few things with you. We can experience God and know him more personally by seeing him as a loving, heavenly father who longs to be with us. You see that God desires our fellowship is amazing. That he actually wants to be with us is even more extraordinary. You see, God personally and passionately pursues a relationship with us. All throughout the Bible, starting in Genesis and Abraham and Isaac and in Jacob and all throughout the New Testament, you see God pursuing us no matter who we are or what we've done or what our background has been. God loves us anyway, and he passionately and personally pursues us. It's so beautiful and affectionately pursues us. So in order to experience God, you need to see him as a loving heavenly father who longs to be with you. A.W. Tozer, in his classic book, The Knowledge of the Holy, he said this, 
What comes to our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. He goes on to say, we tend by a secret law of the soul to move towards our mental image of God. You see, whatever our mental image of God is, whatever we think about God, our soul will move towards it. So if you think of God as being disengaged from you, you will, you'll be in disengaged from him. If you think God is disinterested in you, then you will be disinterested in him. If you think of God as demanding, you'll be afraid to go near him. If you think of God as out to get you or disappointed in you, you'll avoid being with him. And if you think of God as just a genie in a bottle, well, you'll only go to him when you need something. But God never meant for our relationship to him to be like that. You know, many people think of God the way they do maybe authority figure in their life. And if that authority figure was unloving or harsh or absent, that's the way they view God. But listen, Frank Hammond, who is a minister, he said this, it is a common mistake to assume that when human love has failed, that God's love has also failed. Listen, God is not like that authority figure in your life that failed you. God is a loving, heavenly father. So you need to approach God and view him in a right way in order to be close to him. You see, if you see God as a loving father, if you see him as kind and compassionate, if you see him as caring for you in the intimate details of your life, you'll want to be close to him like David. And so I want to pray right now that if there's any thought in your mind of a misunderstanding of who God really is, I want to pray for you that God will take out that ungodly view of God and replace it with a true uh, view of God. So, God, we pray right now for everyone listening that, God, no matter what they think of God, maybe they think he's disinterested, maybe they think he's disengaged, maybe they think he's harsh and demanding. Lord, it's not true. And I pray, God, you would come by the Spirit of God and you would help them to see that you are a loving, kind, gentle Father who loves them and cares about them. I pray for everyone that has been running from God in shame and they're afraid to get near God, that you s would see that Jesus came and died on that cross to heal them and deliver them and to forgive them. And that, God, when you look at them, you see them only with a heart of love and compassion and care. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, the other thing is that many times people have come to me and said, you know, Amy, I want to be close to God, but I can't feel his presence like that other person. They look at that person on the front row of church or that person in small group, and they say, you know, I, I'm not close to God like that. I guess I just haven't been experiencing God. Well, I love this, what Henry Blackaby says. He says, watch for ways God may bring you into a deep knowledge of him through the experiences of your life. As you look at all the ways the Bible describes God, try to remember experiences in your life that have helped you to know God. So like this, God is described as the bread of life. He's described as the comforter in sorrow. He's described as the wonderful counselor, a God who forgives, the, the God who loves us with an everlasting love. He's described as a faithful God. He's described as our father, a friend, our peace, our help our stronghold, and our support. I want to ask you right now, what characteristic of God that I just listed have you known by experience? Maybe you don't feel him with, feel him with your feelings, but you've experienced his peace. You've experienced him as a comforter. You've received wisdom from God. Well, I want to tell you, dear Christian, you have experienced God. If you've experienced some kind of character of God, like I've just listed, you've experienced God. I want to encourage you with that. So the other thing we can do to experience more of God in our life, that we can know God more, is to meditate on the Bible. You see, the way we choose to approach something is the, what we're going to get out of it. It's going to determine the outcome of the meeting. So if you go into a meeting with like a job interview, apprehensive, then you, that's the way you're going you're gonna to feel. If you go into meeting your future in-laws with fear, that's the way you're going to feel. But if you go into it with expectation, if you go into it with excitement, 
that's what you're going to feel you're going to experience it's the same way with meeting with god and in his word go into that time in god's word with anticipation you know i love to pray psalm 119 in um and basically it's verse 18 god open my eyes then i may behold wonderful things in your word you have an expectation you're excited and so I want you to go into, the, into your time with God like that. You know, D.L. Moody, the great evangelist, he said this, when you pray, you talk to God. When you read the Bible, God talks to you. That's what it's like when we get into that time with God. And so, listen, many times when we're reading our Bible, we go right into Bible reading and we ask ourselves, well, um, what does this mean for me or how can this help me? But the thing about Bible reading is before you can apply it, you need to understand it, all right? And so I'm going to give you a method of Bible study called the 5 R's Bible Study Method. We're going to go through this briefly. I'm going to give you a, a worksheet, and you'll be able to download it if you're watching online. And you're going to be able to study verses of the Bible to get revelation out of it. So first of all, you need to pick a reading plan. Because if you have a reading plan, like pick a book of the Bible, and then the next day you're not going all over the Bible trying to figure out what to do next. You can just go right back to that book of the Bible where you left off. And let's say you're reading a, a, a book of the Bible and you're reading a passage. And first thing you're going to do is you're going to read that Bible verse over and over and over again. And each time you read it, you're going to, just look at it and slow down, and you're going to notice key words in that verse. I also encourage you to read several translations, because when you read different translations, you kind of get a different cam camera angle. Also, I would like you to um, just look at the author's original intent and the context of the verse, all right? And, and as you look, what came before it and what came after it? That's reading the text. The next thing in the five hours is rewrite. I would like you to rewrite just as it was written in your Bible. Write things down. Writing things down helps the information sink in, all right? The simple act of writing forces us to think about what it is we are reading. Now, notice I keep saying slow down. I love this, what Charles Spurgeon said. Some people like to read so many chapters every day. I would not dissuade them from the practice, but I would rather have my soul soaking in a few verses all day than to rinse my hand in several chapters. Oh, to be bathed in a text of scripture and let it be sucked up into your very soul until it saturates your heart. This is what we're talking about, meditating the word of God, slowing down, reading the verse, and now what you're doing is you're taking that verse and you're rewriting it. You're literally writing it down. And as you're writing it down, again, you're noticing, look at that. They keep repeating that word. I, that word is sticking out to me. Then what you're going to do is you're going to restate it in your own words without deviating from the original meaning. So you're going to take that verse and you're going to paraphrase it, all right? Like, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You're going to rewrite it and say, no matter what I'm going through, God is there to strengthen me and to help me. You see, you've just rewritten it, not deviating from the original text, but you're rewriting it in your own words. Then you're going to relate it to your life. You're going to say, how has th I've seen this verse to be true in my own life? In the worksheet, literally write down, I was going through a very tough time over the last year, but I noticed that God was there to comfort me and strengthen me. He would send a friend to text me at the right time, a friend to pray for me, to meet with me. And God spoke to me through the word several ways and strengthened me during that time. And it gave me the strength that I can do all things. I can get through this difficult time. You're writing that down as you're relating it to your life. And then the five thing, the, l the fifth thing, is you're responding. How will you apply this verse to your life? Talk to God, God about what you're reading. The evangelist D.O. Moody also said, the Bible was not given to increase our knowledge, but to change our life. The goal of Bible reading is to get close to God, to meet with God, to have an encounter with Jesus Christ. It's not just to gain knowledge. God wants you to be close to him. So when you go into Bible reading, 
Go with the expectation that you're going to encounter God and he's going to speak to you from those verses. And so when we do this, we can ask ourselves, is there a sin I need to confess as I've been reading these verses? Is there a promise to claim? Is there an attitude to change? Is there a command to obey, an example I need to follow? Is there a truth to believe or something I need to praise God for? You see, this is responding to the verse that you're studying. So the 5R Bible study is you're reading, you're rewriting, you're restating, you're relating, and you're responding. And at the end of this step, next step class, you're going to have a chance to actually go through this on your own. The fourth and final thing is we can know God more and we can have this ex relationship with God by practicing a life of prayer and worship. Now, that sounds kind of obvious, but many times we don't take that time to pray and experience God through worship. But if we want to be close to God and experience him as our closest friend, this is very critical, not just reading the word of God and knowing who he is to us and our, our image of him, but also prayer and worship. You see, being close to God is similar to getting close to a friend. You spend time with them. You talk with them. Prayer is simply talking with God. It's a conversation. And like all conversations, it's a two-way conversation. You are talking to God, but when you're praying, allow him to talk to you. Get in the habit of pausing, meditating, really listening for God to speak to you out of his word. I really love this by E.M. Bounds. He says, prayer should not be regarded as a duty that must be performed, but rather a privilege to be enjoyed, a rare delight that is always revealing some new beauty of God. Isn't that beautiful? This is what prayer is all about. I love to start out my prayer time in Psalm 100, verse 4. It says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. There is something so beautiful about starting out your prayer life with thanking God. Because honestly, it puts the focus on God rather on you. Because many times we come into prayer thinking about our needs and our wants and our desires. But like all good friendships, God wants you to approach him and he wants to have a relationship with you, not just one way. And so thanksgiving causes you to focus on God. It causes you to think about him and hit the longings of his heart. And so I come to my prayer time. I say, God, I thank you. Thank you for my salvation. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for healing me. Thank you for my husband. Thank you for my children. Thank you for my church family. Thank you, God, for all you've done in my life, for keeping me healthy. God, I, I begin to thank God. And, that I, and the Bible says we, with, we enter his gates with thanksgiving, but then it says we enter his courts with praise. You guys, praise and worship is one of the most beautiful ways that we can grow in our walk with God. When we praise the Lord, when we worship him and sing pray, uh, songs of praise to him, oh, my goodness, God is so delighted. I love this. I love this, what um, C.S. Lewis says. When we pray and worship God, we're actually giving him worth. And he says this, that it is in the process of being worshipped, C.S. Lewis says, that God communicates his presence to men. You know, a lot of times we say, God, I want to sense your presence, but I don't know how. One of the most beautiful ways to sense the presence of God is to worship him. But you know, it's a discipline in a good, in a delightful discipline is that many times we're distracted and we're thinking and we're kind of looking around and we're thinking about all the things we need to do. But I really want to encourage you to put on worship music or at church on Sunday and just to block out all the things that are on your mind, literally lift your hands or get on your knees and say, Jesus, I love you. I worship you. Thank you, God. And then turn on a worship song and just begin to worship God. Literally with all your heart, everything within you, every emotion. And I am telling you, like, like C.S. Lewis said, is in the process of being worshipped that God communicates his presence to men. Many times as well, I like to listen to old hymns and I like to pray old hymns. Other things I love to do is go through the Psalms and pray the Psalms and then worship the Psalms. 
it's so beautiful. God will communicate his presence to you, and you'll go cl so close to God as you enter his courts with thanksgiving and into his, his gates with prayer. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with prayer. So as we end this session, how can I know God? Listen, God longs to be close to you. He doesn't want you to know about him, a bunch of facts about him. He wants to know you personally. Have faith that Jesus did everything he needed to do to bring you into relationship with him. God wants you to let go of your shame. He wants you to let go of your guilt. He wants you to let go of your false images of God your misunderstandings, God is a loving Father, and he longs to be close to you. He chooses to, to reveal himself to you, and he passionately pursues you and affectionately loves you. See him that way. Read his word. Practice a life of prayer and worship, and you will see that your relationship with God will go closer and closer. This is step two. God wants to know you, and this is how you can know God. Yes. All right. All right. The last thing I want to do is I want to encourage you that another way you can experience God and know him personally is to get around other cr Christians who are close to God and experiencing God. You see, they will inspire you in your walk with God. I want to encourage you to be part of a church family. I want to encourage you to come and worship with other believers. I want to encourage you to get in a small group and to be with those believers that can inspire you in your walk with Jesus. Thank you so much for being a part of Step 2, How Can I Know God? I'm so excited for your journey. I can't wait for you to um, continue in our next step, Step 3, How Can I Follow Jesus? And also the last step, in our completion class. And as you end this session, we have a survey we would like you to take. You can fill that out and complete that survey, and that will show that you've completed this course, and you can go on to step three. God bless. Thank you so much.